Jan Grunfeld, I met uh, in Australia in 19... Gee, that's a... You were a little boy then. Well, it was... <laughs> and uh, she uh, drove me from uh, city to city to give talks. Yeah. Her and her husband. Now she's here in the United States coming to our convention. And there are no wasted years, she tells us, but we'll learn more from her. Jen is a former Jehovah's Witness and a Mormon. She is actively and effectively helping those ensnared by false prophets to come to the real Jesus through freedom in Christ ministry. What's that? Christ and Lord. I'll give you a hug. Oh. Uh, Thank you. This guy, he's, he's responsible. It's his fault. <laughs> Isn't it great? Great. This is my third convention, and I wish I could come every year. It took me so long to get here the first time after I heard about everyone. When I met Bill, until I met Bill, the only two ex-Jehovah's Witnesses in the world that I knew were Christians were myself and Charles Trombley. I didn't know that there were other people that felt like I did, queer. <laughs> and then Bill came to Australia to speak, he came to Brisbane, and I heard about it and I rang up the church and I said, I need to talk to that man, I want him for a whole afternoon. Well, they'd experienced my queerness for about two years and I think they were glad to hand me over. And they let me be his chauffeur from that time on and so Simon and I, and I do have a husband for those of you who are wondering, Sheila can attest to it, she's met him too. And uh, he, we, we just drove Bill around and it was really great and that's when I found out that you'd had your first convention in 1979 and oh how I wanted to come I wanted to come I finally came 1986 was my first time here 1988 I was here two years ago and I'm here again I think one of the great things about the years I spent in the cult is that it taught me when I came out to start using my own brain to start thinking for myself and not to rely on what other people said to me. Now this can get people like myself into a lot of trouble at times because I'm always disagreeing with someone but I don't mind disagreeing with some people. We just had our convention at the end of September and we were blessed to have Dr Robert Moray as one of our major speakers but we had an ex-Scientologist on our program. I don't just deal with Jehovah's Witnesses in my ministry, I deal with other cults as well. And we had an ex-Scientologist who also spoke two years ago but that was just during his floating time when he wasn't quite free in his mind. This year we had half the Scientologists in Brisbane turn up to our convention and try to cause problems for us. They're not like Jehovah's Witnesses who try to pretend we don't exist the Scientologists actually sign a statement when they join saying that they will actively work to demolish any organisation that tries to stop the spread of Scientology. And praise God, they think I'm a threat. <laughs> they turned up at our convention handing out this paper which is one of the beautiful, most beautiful pieces of libel I have ever seen in my life. <coughs> they have accused me of using sleep deprivation and forcible sex to deprogram people. <laughs> and this is the opening to their statement. This is the heading, anti-religious movement, contemporary terrorism, kidnapping and psychiatric brutality. Good stuff. An anti-religious awareness convention being held in Brisbane is a front 
for psychiatric terrorism. The conference is hosted by Mrs Jan Groenveld who has herself undergone psychological counselling and whose associates include at least one psychiatrist who wants to see religion banned in Australia. Groenveld recommends people to professionals skilled in psychological or psychiatric depersonalisation an often brutal brainwashing technique of kidnapping, sleep deprivation and psychological violence in an attempt to dissuade an individual from their chosen, no, they, they say chosen, chosen religious belief. The psychiatrist they're quoting was Dr Joan Lawrence who is quoted in this article that's in our last newsletter and what Dr Joan Lawrence actually said is that she couldn't see that uh, we could do anything about cults she said, we enjoy basic freedom in this country and cannot ban religions. So they've taken that. So they, they're no different to the witnesses. They love to misquote. But it's really good to know that you're finally being recognised. <laughs> I'm a threat to the devil. Hallelujah. They came around on the Monday after the convention so they couldn't intimidate us. We had them yelling and screaming and carrying on at the end of our convention. The tape is absolutely superb. Sheila's husband was trying to be protective of me. He didn't realise fully that I didn't need protecting from him or anyone else because Jesus Christ goes before me. But uh, we had a really, really great time and uh, they came around on the Monday seeking a truce with me which tells me that they were very, very frightened of me because they couldn't intimidate me. I informed them that they could demolish Freedom in Christ because Freedom in Christ, the ministry, is a few books, a few filing cabinets, a computer and a few bits and pieces. They could, could demolish that. The only way they could stop me was to kill me. And if they killed me, they'd have the same problem Nero had. Every time he killed a Christian, two stood up in their place. <laughs> I didn't know that the day before, Sheila's husband, Kel, had told them, if you kill Jan, there'll be six in her place. <laughs> I love it. No, that they can't intimidate me, I won't stop. I won't stop because the law didn't stop. How many of you have felt when you came out of the cult that you'd wasted all those years? Let me see. Come on, be honest. You'd wasted all those years. Well, I won't ask you to tell me who still does. I hear it all the time. I've wasted all those years, 40 years, 50 years, 10 years. Why, why did I waste it? How many still hear people saying that? How many hear it? Do you still hear it? Yeah. If you turn with me to John chapter 9. And as he passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God may be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, as long as it is day, night is coming, when no man can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. That man was born blind to show the glory of God. Were well, all the years that he was blind wasted years? We can look at the examples in scripture. We can look at Noah who spent all those years building an ark. We could look at Moses who spent 40 years as a child in Pharaoh's house and another 40 years in the wilderness. We can look at Jacob who spent all those years in service, we can look at Joseph, we can look at, Moses, uh, look at Ruth, we can look at Paul, he was a man who was a Pharisee, who spent all those years, years as a devout Jew, one of the early Jehovah's Witnesses. Hmm. Yeah. 
You know, I think the life of Paul is probably one of the prime examples for us because it speaks of people who are trying to follow the Lord Jesus, trying to follow God, not the Lord Jesus Christ, but trying to follow God and being zealous in their religion. Zealous in their religion, sometimes to the point of utter stupidity. Yeah, because they really want to serve God and that's what I did. You know, I started off, a little girl, I used to go and sit out. My mother was a a hatch, match and dispatch Christian. I don't know whether you have that term here, but she turned up to church for christenings, weddings and funerals. Hatch, match and dispatch. Okay, you've learnt something. <clears throat> My stepfather was an atheist. He hated religion to the point of being very vicious about it at times. And I can remember when I was about six years of age, I used to go and sit in a little outdoor Sunday school run by some people from the very church I now attend. The Lord brought me around a full circle. And they told me about Jesus. They told me about how he died for me. And they told me that he could be my friend. And I wanted a friend like that. So that was when I first asked Jesus to come into my heart when I was a little child of six. Now at that stage of my life, I'd been physically abused very badly and it continued for many more years. I'd been emotionally abused very badly and that continued for many more years. And I had been sexually abused for three years to that point and that continued for a few more years. So I was an abused child at that point but it was the one thing that I had to cling on to at that time in my life was Jesus. My parents ridiculed me when I told them about the commitment that I'd made at that time. So I kept it to myself and wasted a little bit more time. Well, that's what it seems like. When I was 14 I went to the Billy Graham crusade when he was over there and I had been taken there by the youth leader at the church that my mother and father had now let me go to, the Anglican church, because it was good and solid and I was sure not to get into too much trouble and it also gave me the opportunity to take my brother and sisters to Sunday school and get them out of Dad's hair on Sunday morning so he could read the paper. And... um, I went there and I again made that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there was no follow-up. And as a result of the abuse that I'd been receiving for years, I was already a very different type of individual to the average teenager. So I did not fit in very well with my peers. That continued on for a few years and I met and married my husband. I'm still married to him, we just celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary in 1963 when I was 18. Now you've worked out how old I am. And um, we decided we weren't going to argue about religion. He'd been raised sort of in the Presbyterian church, Dutch Reformed then Presbyterian. I'd been, by this time I was a Calathumpian, I think I was a bit of everything. And I I went wherever I was welcomed and uh, unfortunately I wasn't welcomed by most peer group uh, parents because uh, they knew too much about my background and they didn't want their children associating with a child who'd been soiled. And so when we married we moved away and we decided we weren't going to fight about religion. So we would search around until we found the right church to go to and the easy way to do that in those days was to listen to the radio and this is what we did, we listened to the radio and every church, Australia is different to the United States, you've got 
You can set up a radio station anywhere you wish and broadcast almost anything you wish. And you can do the same on television, but we can't. And so in those days, we had quite a few religious programs on the radio, not the same today. And uh, one of those was called The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. Uh-huh, yeah. So we started listening to old Herbert and Garner Ted and getting very interested in the Bible. And we did get very interested in the Bible to the point where we were writing backwards and forwards and getting study lessons and so on. But we found out that we had to look for the one true church, the one true church, and we had to look for the people who had the fruits. That's how we tell them. Now, we never got to the lesson where they said they were it. Okay? And we were moving around. We had gypsy feet. Any time we felt... We didn't have many belongings. What we had, we could fit into the back of a car and we could move. So we'd move back to Queensland every time I was having a baby because up in Queensland we had a free hospital system. And we didn't have to worry about medical bills. So every time we were having a child, we'd move back up to Queensland and then we'd keep travelling around. Well, after the second child, we decided we'd stay in Queensland. We moved up a little bit further where they were making the alumina plant in Gladstone, which is in the central north coast of Australia. And it was there, in amongst a thousand other families, all in this little tiny caravan park on the estate of the uh, site workers, that the Seventh-day Adventists came knocking on our door and offering us a free Bible, a really good Bible like this, if we'd go and attend their eight lectures. Well, I'm not one for knocking back a freebie, are you? Right. Okay. So off we went and we started attending the Seventh-day Adventist lectures. It was also about this time that uh, actually it was when we were up there that our second child was born. Um, about this time that we also met another young couple and they, were, they impressed us because they were very Christian in their attitude. They looked after my daughter for me. They were so helpful. And they used to go off to church every Sunday morning but they never said anything to us. We didn't know who they were associated with until one day two young men in white shirts, dark trousers with American accents, riding bicycles, turned up at their front door of the caravan. That's when we found out they were Mormons. For the next few weeks we were still studying with the Worldwide Church of God. We were going to the Seventh-day Adventist lectures and having the Mormon lessons. You talk about confusion... Exactly. We had confusion. But on my 21st birthday we were baptised into the Mormon church because we saw solid fruit there. It, they looked good. We didn't, never got our indigestion, the burning in the bosom or any other testimony that the Book of Mormon was the word of God and that Joseph Smith was a true prophet. And not once on Testimony Sunday could I ever stand up and say that. All I had here was Jesus. That's all I had. We were Mormons for about three years and towards the end of that time we had a little baby girl and she only lived 12 hours. But I couldn't understand why God would let me have a baby that would die. That seemed to me very cruel. And when I asked the Mormons, the Mormon bishop, he said, well, you know, it's basically, if you understand Mormon doctrine, they believe we were spirit children before we came here and we come down here to get our body, to get our name and then we can go on to exaltation or to our reward. If you're really good, you get born into a Mormon family, you go through the temple service and so on and you go to number, three, top, number one level of num the number one heaven, okay, to go on becoming gods and goddesses. Well, they told me that the reason why Leah only lasted 12 hours was because she was such a good spirit child in her pre-existence that all she had to do was come down here, be born into a Mormon family and she could go on ready for her exaltation. She was too good to stay here on earth. Now, you'd think that could be a compliment, but it caused a minor problem to me because I knew the pain I was going through. 
I also knew I could never have another full-term baby and that I could have a baby like that every year and as a good Mormon I shouldn't take any contraceptive measures and I should have a baby every year to have plenty of these good spirit children. So I mentioned that to the bishop and he said I should count myself blessed. I didn't feel very blessed. It was during that initial mourning period that I got the knock on the door and two ladies were talking to me that day and they could see there was something wrong and one went and made me a cup of tea because I was back to tea and coffee very quickly and the other one didn't take me long to slip up Uh, (laughs) yeah slurp up (laughs) and the other one sat down and showed me how my little baby was in, in, in the grave and she was asleep But she also showed me, and this was um, just at the beginning of 69, this was, she died at the end of, uh, 68 I mean, she died at the end of 67, and uh, that Armageddon was just around the corner. And this was the beginning of the build-up to 1975. This was the very beginning of the build-up to 1975. Well, I was uh, sort of wanting an answer, and I slowly but surely, like in a matter of days, grabbed onto that because they showed me everything from the Bible. And if it was one thing I had never ever rejected was that the Bible was God's word and what it said held true and that was it. So I clung to that. And I started to study with Jehovah's Witnesses during the next year. I had another baby. He was only three pounds five ounces born. He's now 22 years old in a few weeks' time and somewhere up here in this massive, great big hunk of a kid. Shouldn't have lived. Should be blind and he should have cerebral palsy and he's got neither because those babies never lived very long in those days. And he's been kept for a purpose. I keep telling him that, that God's going to get him for whatever he wants. But... I grabbed onto that and then I slowly but surely was indoctrinated with Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs. And you know, I, was, I thought I was being careful. I didn't jump into Jehovah's Witnesses all the way, right up to baptism like I did with the Mormons. I was going to make sure this time. So I made sure this time. <laughs> My husband during this period of time had had enough of religion so he went and joined the Royal Australian Air Force. (laughs) And we moved south and it was during that time I also started nursing which I had to then general training which I had to give up because the matron finally told me when I was getting ready for baptism that I could be a Jehovah's Witness or I could be a nurse but I couldn't be both in her hospital. And that was probably the catalyst that gave me the final decision to become a Jehovah's Witness. And so I became a Jehovah's Witness. That weekend I was baptised, I went home, I rang my mother up and I said, Mum, guess what? I was baptised as a Jehovah's Witness on Saturday morning. She says, oh, I've got wonderful news for you too. I went to this Christian meeting last night and I was born again. (laughs) So she started raving on. I mean, she'd been born again like something like 12 hours and she was already a raving lunatic. Anyway, she told me she was going to pray for me and I told her I was going to pray for her. And here I stand. My mother had a very clever pastor. She went off and told him what I'd done and he said, don't you say a word to her. You wait because she'll start preaching to you and that's your opening. And sure enough, my letters to her went from little half page, I hate writing letters, I did then, half pages, hi mum, I'm fine, the kids are fine, Simon's fine, everything's good, love Jan. She then got 60, I went and bought a typewriter, 16 typewritten pages of watchtower quotes and she'd take it all to her pastor and he would pick one point and send back a do-dandy question 
and I never answered one of them because every one of them I couldn't. And I learnt very early in the piece not to question anything. I became very much a fanatical Jehovah's Witness because I wanted to survive Armageddon because I wanted to see my baby girl again. I also wanted my children to get through Armageddon so I was tough on them too. And even 15 years after leaving that organisation, my children are still recovering from the effects of seven short years. Things went on and by the time 1975 came, I was starting to see through the organisation just little chinks. My mother's questions were getting very embarrassing. It was the beginning of 1975 that my friend, my rebellious French Jehovah's Witness friend, she was like me, just very outspoken Jehovah's Witness, and uh, she and I decided we'd take our children to a slide series being held at a, an ordinary public hall in the town um, instead of going witnessing on Sunday. And we... <laughs> We took our children to see the slide series because, you know, the kids are pretty deprived of Jehovah's Witnesses and we didn't know they were Seventh-day Adventist slides. <laughs> but we went and the first Sunday they had nothing religious much there, you know, and the second Sunday there was nothing much there. The third Sunday there was a bit of religion being brought into this and we were sort of looking at each other but it, it was still interesting. We went the fourth Sunday just to see what their doctrine was compared to ours. And we thought ours was crazy, theirs was even crazier. <laughs> but it was that weekend that they found out who we were. And it was during that time in Australia that Seventh-day Adventists were getting very, very active in proselytising Jehovah's Witnesses. That's when Bruce Price who was the leading evangelist for this area in Australia started getting very active and they were well equipped to deal with us and the evangelist that was running this series turned up at my home now I'd already been through the Adventist kick I'd rejected the Sabbath teaching way back so I was never going to become an Adventist but he was really working hard on me and he got the Kingdom Interlinear Translation, the best weapon you've got, brothers and sisters, if you really want to show them what the Watchtower Society has done to a Bible. And he got that out and he had Revelation 3.14 there showing me how they change from by to of, right? And I could see it, but do you think I was going to tell him? There was no way in the world I was going to bring reproach on Jehovah's name by admitting to anyone what I could see. And he finally said, I'm going to show you something. And he pulled out all the papers on Beth Sarum. Yeah. And he showed me all these photocopies about old Watchtower publications and I thought, ah, oh, they're all fakes. Anyone could put to things, together things like that. Then I remembered... I had one of those books up on my shelf given to me by an old witness, the Salvation Book. And I went and got it down and sure enough it was an authentic copy and it said Beth Sarum was for Abraham, Isaac and all the faithful prophets of old. About two weeks before that we got the 1975 yearbook and I had just read page 91 where it said Beth Sarum had been built because of Rutherford's bad health only a couple of days before this fellow turned up at my door and it clicked and my heart dropped somewhere around about the other side of the world and I didn't say anything but he said something he said you're all expecting Armageddon well you mark my words when Armageddon doesn't come this year like it's expected they're going to come up with a good excuse and then they'll proceed to blame you people for having believed it just like they did back in 1925. And I kept that in here. And I went to the District Assembly in 1975 and ours was during our summer which means that we had ours in November, the end of November 1975. And I heard the excuse why Armageddon didn't come and I got up and it was the last meeting I ever went to. 
By the end of December, I was an alcoholic and well on the way to becoming a drug addict. It completely devastated my life. And for the next two and a half years, I stayed in that state. And my mother kept praying. And all her friends kept praying. Until the Lord moved us back to Queensland and there one Sunday morning I saw a television program where people were happy and smiling on church, the very church where you and I met Bill. And I finally went to that church and once more on the 8th of August 1978 gave my life back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't think women could preach. I didn't think women could teach until Bill straightened me out. But I had in my heart here a burden, the same burden that the Apostle Paul had when he says, I would that I could give up my salvation for my brothers and sisters whom I've left behind. But I also thought, oh Lord, I've wasted all that time. How can you ever forgive me? But he showed me his friend, the Apostle Paul. He said Paul's life wasn't wasted. He went through training. And that's how we need to see all the years we spent out there. No matter what's happened to us, they have been years in training. It's when we learn from our mistakes that we've learnt something that's positive and you know I looked back and I looked back even further than my years in the cults and I said Lord why did you let me get abused like that as a child but now our counselling over there we're finding more and more of the people who have gone into the cults have been emotionally physically and sexually abused as young children and I'm finding that there is not one area of my life that the Lord Jesus Christ is now not able to use. He can use every single thing that I've ever been through whether it's been the abuse, whether it's been the loss of a child, whether it's been the cults, no matter what I've been through He's been able to use it just like he used this blind man for his glory. He can use it. So if you're feeling despondent because you've gone through things that you've not been able to cope with, the Lord can heal the hurts, brothers and sisters. He can make you whole. You give that to him and start seeing those things in a different light. And the pain is not there. Because he can use every single thing to minister to other brothers and sisters who are going to come to you in the future. Everything is done to his glory. Everything. I often think, I love the hymn Amazing Grace. I love that hymn. I can't sing that hymn through without crying. But there's one part of that hymn that really means something to me. And the stanza is, Through many dangers, toils and snares I have already come. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. Remember the story of the footprints in the sand? That's God's grace. And brothers and sisters, you can walk in God's grace no matter where you're going, no matter who attacks you, no matter who says anything to you. You stand there in God's grace. He's right in front of you. He'll stay with you and he'll take you home. You do not have to be weak. You do not have to be frightened. You do not have to worry and fear for your loved ones. He already knows. He already knows. He already knows. You get those loved ones. Sister, you get your little boy and you just say, Jesus, here he is. He already knows. 
He already knows. He's claimed your son. He will come through. Nothing happens that he hasn't allowed. And nothing happens that will not finally bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.